Okay, so we're going to start in the next session. Uh, we're starting this session with a featured talk. This is an invited talk uh, from a local uh, researcher uh, in the in this practicing in the field. And today we're going to have Mike Dodds from Galois talking about continuously verified cryptography. Hey, um, so I'm a principal scientist at Galois, and so I wanted just to sort of start out by talking a bit about what Galois is because I feel like we don't have as much visibility in this community as I, as uh, as you know as I would like. So Galois is a uh, research and development lab. Uh, we started out in Portland. Uh, we've got sort of three locations. There's about 70 people there. There's a really ridiculous number of PL people in Galois at the moment. I think it must be sort of 40 or 50. So it's really a very large number of people. And we're sort of really, we're kind of like a PL meets applications kind of a shop, really. So um, lots of programming languages, lots of analysis, lots of verification, lots of security and crypto. Um, and we tend to use these kind of things, so symbolic execution and model checking. Um, a history is really in Haskell. So our founder was a guy called John Launchbury, who was like very in influential in the early sort of Haskell design of Haskell. But we also uh, we've also kind of branched out into all sorts of other programming languages as well. So and just to give you an idea of the sort of people who work there. Uh, my background is uh, I was a professor in the UK, um, mostly interested in separation and concurrency, relaxed memory. And so, like, I suppose that, you know, this is, I'm going to be completely honest with you, we're recruiting at the moment, so you guys should apply. <laughs> but um, any, basically, anybody who, uh, anybody who sort of would write a popple paper or a PLDI paper or a CAV paper, totally welcome at Galois. So, you know, we do a lot of kind of that kind of research. The sales pitch aside. I'm going to talk a bit about continuous verification, which is a very cool project, which uh, actually I was mostly not involved with. So I'm going to talk about other people's research today. Um, so actually, the people who did this were these awesome group of people. I think there are a couple of them missing off here because I couldn't find pictures. Um, particularly uh, Byron Cook over the far side there and his group at Amazon, and uh, a whole bunch of people in, uh, in Galois, including Aaron Tome, who's here today, and Eric Mullen, who did some awesome stuff, who is around here somewhere. Um, so let me just kind of give a bit of context. Something that I find very exciting is that static analysis tools are starting to get out there into the real world. And people are starting to use them in software development workflows. And that's very, very cool. So um, Google is starting to use a tool called Error Prone. So they run that on pretty much every commit that goes into their, into their repository. For so Facebook, are also they have this magnificent tool called Infer, which I'm very happy to say is a separation logic tool. It makes me very, very sort of warm and fuzzy inside to say that. And Amazon have this tool as well, which is what I'll talk about today, uh, which is using a tool called SOAR. So this is really part of their code quality process. So really, the, the, the hmm? Microsoft's been doing that since, since 2000. <laughs> 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 I mean, no, no, were, sorry, yeah. Trying, you, my, to, and Microsoft no, here, no, here no, Microsoft no. is here. You know, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the thing I wanted to distinguish is really that they're doing it as part of their DevOps process. And I don't know how much Microsoft are doing that, but let's, oh, we can talk about that. OK. I feel like, you, you know. 20 years ago. OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> hey there, sorry. It's, uh, it's all, it's, you know, no, that's understandable. I apologize. Um, but the motivation here is really, they want to sort of improve code quality. They want to kind of, and so there are lots of things that companies do to improve code quality. They have revision control and testing and peer review. And big companies are just starting to use static analysis as part of that pipeline. So that's very cool. Like programming languages ideas, analysis ideas are getting out there. So the thing that Galois got into was uh, the uh, was Amazon's verification, uh, Amazon, the Amazon verification story. And so this is something where we're doing proofs of correctness, we're doing it on core infrastructure, and we're doing it using a symbolic execution tool called SOAR. Now, I'm going to, to, to TLS. I don't now have to explain to you why TLS is important, but we're doing something on a on a, a on an implementation of TLS. This is a bit different in flavor from Everest because instead of having a out from sort of from start first principles implementation of TLS, we're going to go to Amazon's existing TLS implementation and prove some things correct about it. Um, so Amazon's uh, TLS implementation was really inspired. It's a kind of it's a new implementation, but it's not designed particularly for verification. So it was inspired by all the horrible vulnerabilities that people were found, finding. And so it drops some of the insecure and less secure features. It's much smaller. It's only, so for example, OpenSSL is 70K lines of code, and S2N is only 6K. And the component that I'll talk about verifying today is HMAC, which is the uh, uh, keyed hash message authentication code um, implementation. 
So HMAC is really the thing that provides a signature for the message when you're sending it over TLS. Um, so it gives you authentic, uh, authenticity and integrity. And actually, the really nice thing about HMAC that makes it very amenable to verification is that the specification itself is really tiny. This is pretty much what you see in the RFC. The RFC is like a bunch of kind of like boilerplate sort of discussion. And there's like one line of math which tells you what HMAC does. And um, so that makes it, that's very good from us. That means we can kind of write it down. Um, and so what we'd really like is to sort of take this HMAC specification, which is concise and e easily auditable, and we'd like to connect it to the C HMAC implementation, which is fast and interoperable. It's also got some structural differences from the way that HMAC is defined here. Um, and so here's the summary of the approach. We're going to write a formal specification. We're going to write some scaffolding to bridge that gap. And then we're going to use some tools. And then we're going to, and crucially, we're going to integrate it into the CI development environment. So the first step is to write a formal specification. So it turns out that because we've already got a specification language for crypto, we can just write it down pretty much straight off. So here's the you know, roughly sort of the formal specification, and here's the specification in Cryptol, which is uh, Galois' specification language. And you can see that it's, they're very sort of, you know, modulo syntax, they're pretty much identical. So that means that we can use this. We can also use this to do things like generate tests. We can use it to synthesize code. Those are two things that we've done with Cryptol in the past. But in this case, we're using it to verify existing code. So now we want to connect the HMAC specification to the uh, C HMAC. And that's kind of more of a challenge because we want to sort of know that the, uh, we really want to kind of like know that these two things really do the same thing. So we're going to have to build some scaffolding to bridge that gap because there's too big a gap just to do this off. You can think of this as kind of part of the, proving, the proof process. So we're going to do this by layers of abstraction. We're going to have high-level crypto code. Then we're going to have some lower-level crypto code that sort of mirrors the structure of the C code. And then we're going to have some uh, production S to N code. And um, when we get to this point, we're going to incorporate S2N data structures and the S2N API. And we, but we're going to omit some gnarly features like pointers and memory allocation, low-level optimizations. So once we've kind of got this pipeline, once we've kind of built our high-level spec, our low-level spec, and the S2N, uh, uh, connects it to the S2N, we're then going to want to kind of actually show that those two things are related to each other. So the tool we're going to use is something that Galois have been using for a very long time, which is a tool called the Software Analysis Workbench. It's really a symbolic execution tool. So roughly, you can think of it as saying, you take a thing, you take an artifact and another artifact, and you turn them both into sort of SMT things, and then you compare those two things together. You, so you use symbolic execution to build those kind of SMT comparable things. Um, and then we can just sort of chuck it in an SMT solver. And so then we kind of, um, I should say, by the way, one way that crypto code is, uh, we sort of get away with um, making our lives easier is in this case, all of this crypto code doesn't have loops in. So we're just talking about loop-free code. So then we chuck it at, at SOAR, and it tells us whether it's correct or not. And then we're going to, then once we've done that proof, we want to integrate it into the dev development environment. And so that means that we want to have continuous integration. Now, why do you want continuous integration? Well, you want it so that nobody makes any mistakes. So you want don't new mistakes to be introduced into the system. So we've set it up so that the proofs run automatically on the code changes. So that means that when you commit a piece of code, then you can't commit it to the repository if, it doesn't if the proofs don't pass. Um, and the proofs are independent of the C code. To uh, they just depend on the interfaces. And that's because you're compiling both the code and the specification down into this SMT representation, which you then basically, you're using the SMT to compare. And the proofs are you know, reasonably easily adaptable. I mean, you know, this is kind of obviously sort of a somewhat movable, but we're not talking about kind of having to do like a cock proof in order to kind of like get this to go through. If the function body changes, it's very likely there are going to be no changes to the proof. And that's because you're just sort of shuffling the internal change, uh, behavior of the code. If the interface changes, you're going to have to change the proof. But it's probably not going to be too big. And if the call structure changes, there are going to be some small kind of uh, changes around the edges. Um, and then we've got, you know, and this is very, very nice. So we kind of integrate it into uh, Amazon Web Services uh, CI system. So that what that means is that every time you commit something to S2N, it runs the build, and the build sort of tells you, did I pass the, uh, did I pass the, did I pass the tests? And so that means that, what, what are we on, like 900 commits? No, not, not that many. How many commits are we on now? I don't remember. I'm not sure, but it's definitely, it's at least, it's in like, it's around 1,000 probably or something. Yeah, it's around 1,000 commits or something. So now, 
953 Travis jobs passed, so ah, okay. pass that. That may not be. That may just be for the whole of S2N, though. Uh, but yeah, it's. Um, but yeah, so the um, and so kind of all this stuff kind of runs, and it means that like, you know if you tried to commit something that would violate one of these uh, violate one of these proofs, then you would need to uh, then you would get an error and you wouldn't be able to commit it. Quick question on the previous slide. Yeah, sure. So when you say um, proof independent, so you don't have like a loop invariance or anything. So when the structure of the code changes, um, if you had a loop invariant, you might need to change. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I mean, if you wanted to, I mean, this is very, you know, the idea with this whole thing is to kind of like focus on a really kind of core critical code and then just kind of like simplify as many of the issues as possible. But there are some sort of, there are some situations where. So SOAR doesn't really do loops, so yeah, it's, it's just doing it's just doing sort of information. path based. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of it's, it's so the reason that we so actually I'll talk about this in just one second. Okay. So there's um, actually the whole pipeline is a bit more complicated than what I mentioned here. We have a uh, CAV paper um, uh, which will be at CAV 18, and um, so down this end we've got sort of proofs with SOAR, mostly automatic. At this level here, we've got the incremental API. So what that means is it's kind of got a bit more structure, and it's actually allowing you to do things like kind of keep on adding messages and then kind of finishing up. So to do this connection between the monolithic and incremental API, we need a little bit of kind of cock to do the sort of induction. And then up here, we've got proofs of indistinguishability from random. And to do that, we have a connection between our high-level specification and some work that Lennart Beringer and other people did on, uh, on sort of proving that HMAC, the, the crypto specification of HMAC is actually correct in terms of its high level security properties. Uh, so we didn't, so uh, Galois didn't just do this. Uh, we did um, DLBG, uh, we did uh, TLS handshake protocols, so state machine proof. Um, and um, we're working on some of the rest, uh, rest of these things. So, uh, so correctness of parsing for various kind of issues. So basically, the work is kind of ongoing with this. I mean, I think that Amazon, um, you know, the way that we've approached this is that we want to kind of pick the high value sort of cases first. Am I about to get kicked off? <laughs> I'm still making a sort of ominous kind of face, I see. Um, anyway, yeah, this kind of thing is feasible, which is very exciting. And it's also kind of, uh, it's also kind of, it's also something which is kind of, I think, becoming more acceptable. It's something which is becoming kind of applied in sort of contexts which aren't Microsoft, which are of course ahead of the curve on this. And um, it's, uh, <laughs> which were um, uh, sort of, it's now being applied in industry. So it's kind of, there's lots of exciting stuff going on in this area, I think. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank the speaker. Uh, it's great to see these back-to-back -back talks really looking at the, the, the theory and the reality of sort of how to do this at scale is really wonderful work. Uh, let's have a couple questions. Nick? Um, how do you boil the TLS handshake into loop-free code? Mm. Aaron, do you want to talk about that? So it's, it's just proving that the, um, there's one function that, that handles a single state machine transition, uh -huh. and we're just proving that that always takes a state to a legal successor state. So that function itself doesn't have any loops in it. It just gets potentially called from a higher level thing that does. And what do you prove about the whole handshake? So we're just proving that that function uh, matches the state machine. That's we don't prove anything outside of that so far. We might in the future. Uh, one other question? Yeah. So what is the, um, the, the business case for Amazon to implement something like this in their pipeline? Is it? Quantified in terms of number of bugs that are causing downtime, or I think that they, I well, I mean, I can't speak for Amazon. I think, but I think that what I hear from talking to people in industry is that they're interested in sort of, they are primarily interested in avoiding bugs and sort of increasing assurance. And I think that there's a lot of people in industry who, uh, in the industry, who are interested in sort of like moving faster as well, to coin a phrase. So they want to sort of reduce the amount of kind of assurance that they have to do for these kind of systems. And you can imagine that for something like TLS, you know, you would like to kind of be able to develop it rapidly or rapidly kind of patch it. And if you have a sort of, if you're going through the normal kind of assurance process that you would have a, have a very long kind of process to be sure that the system was correct. But I think that these kind of tools are really about kind of allowing people to kind of like be more confident in the way they kind of commit, which is an interesting kind of switch of mindset between, I suppose, the kind of like maybe safety critical applications of formal methods, where really the whole point is to kind of achieve a very, very high level of assurance. 
and somewhere like, I don't know, so somewhere like Facebook or Amazon or Google, where really what they want to do is sort of do as little assurance as possible, but still achieve good quality code. So I think that there's kind of a maybe different in, difference in mindsets. But I think, I think that's kind of my broad understanding of why these kind of tools are getting more uptake. OK, and with that, we'll uh, have to defer more questions. But let's thank the speaker again. All right, and our next speaker is Sarah Chasens from UC Berkeley. She's a little bit, little bit far, not, not exactly local, but she, she collaborates with Ross Bodick, and she's going to be talking about Helena, a, a web automation language. Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. I'm going to go ahead and actually start by talking about how many people want data that they might collect off the web. And I think it's a ton right now, but I think it's going to be even more going forward. And in addition to this difference in scale, I think the composition of the folks who are interested in this is going to be changing. So right now, the people who have the tools to access web data, it's mostly going to be people who can code. But going forward, I think a lot of non-coders are getting interested in this stuff. And I'm going to go through a couple examples. So these are all examples from our current social science collaborators. Basically, these are questions that they're asking based on information that they can find on the web. Um, there are a lot of different reasons that the people I'm focusing on mostly are social scientists. And there are a lot of different reasons why they might want to collect these large data sets from the web. But there's not a lot of support for them to do this. So we are breaking it down here into what the coders can use versus what the non-coders can use. There's a ton of stuff in that coders box, all the web scraping libraries that you might already be familiar with. And in the non-coders, the options are more limited. So over here, you really need to be able to actually reverse engineer that web page. So you have to understand the DOM internals. You have to understand how the web page is actually interacting with the web server. That's the unifying thing about all of these libraries. And we can't expect non-coders to do that. So for non-coders, you have some options. You can hire someone who's actually going to sit in front of that browser and copy and paste stuff. Sounds crazy, but it actually happens. Um, you can hire a coder to use one of the tools from the other box. Another thing that definitely happens, but it will require some more resources. Or you can use some of the, the recent programming by demonstration tools that have come out. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on the tool that we've built called Helena. So basically, this is the structure, right? In demonstration goes in, program comes out, maybe the user interacts with the program, does some edits, and then they can use that to collect their data. So we'll do a really quick video demo here. Basically, the idea with Helena is that you are going to demonstrate how you would collect the first row of a relational or a multi-relational data set. So here we've opened up our Chrome extension. We're going to grab information about the first author from a list of authors. And then for that first author, we're going to grab information about the first paper in that author's list of papers. That gives us the whole first row that we want. At this point, Helena is looking at the web pages and trying to figure out if there are any relations for which we might want to repeat some things. So it saw that we interacted with the first author, and it decided to add the loop to go over all authors. It's going to do the exact same thing for papers, at which point we have the full script. We can go ahead and run it, and we're going to watch it actually happening over here in the web page. On the left, we will start to see the data as it gets collected. And so at this point, yeah, now it's collecting it. So that's how we write a web scraper by demonstration. And we can use this. If we let this keep going, this is going to run for 3 million rows. So this is really big data sets that we're collecting based on really a pretty quick programming example. And hopefully, I can make the clicker work to get us to the next slide. Ah, yes. OK. So we gave this to some programmers because we wanted to see if this had some advantages over more traditional web programming. And we couldn't exactly bring in our social scientists and ask them to use Selenium. <laughs> so. We compared the more traditional web programming language Selenium with Helena, and it turns out, yes, with Helena, we're getting time from first use to successful task in about six minutes. And it turns out if you're trying to use a more traditional web programming language, you're probably going to time out at 60 minutes unless you have prior experience. So we're getting a lot of advantages. Um, Basically, though, we then want to go from just that first output draft of the script to how can we make these scripts, which are going to run for a long time. I mentioned 3 million rows. That's going to run for hours and hours. We have to make them robust. We have to make them actually fast. So we're going to ask these end users to do some things that we wouldn't normally ask from the users of an end user programming tool. So in particular, I'm going to be talking about skip blocks. So I'm going to start with a motivating example. We're working with a team of sociologists. And what they want to do is every single night scrape all of the apartment listings off Craigslist in order to give this data to the city of Seattle. They have a contract with them. So 
we were wondering, okay, what's going to be the issue? What's going to be the problem? We thought it would be some subtle algorithmic thing. No, it wasn't anything like that. It was that the undergrad that they had running this every night on his home laptop connected to his home Wi-Fi, in the middle of the night, the Wi-Fi would go out, and in the morning, DAPTA started, and it would go back and do all the same work again. So that was pretty annoying. And then it turns out that even when he wasn't getting these, these Wi-Fi failures, we were still repeating a lot of work just because of how much churn there is in this data. So when you load up Craigslist, it's starting at the beginning of all the results, and then it's indexing into the current list. So by the time you get to page two of your Craigslist data, the things that were the end of page one, if there have been new listings, those have already been pushed onto the head of page two. And you might end up going back and rescraping those. And that's pretty silly. We don't really want to do that. We were wasting hours on that. So what we are going to be talking about here are problems like these, problems that we as the scraping script can't actually prevent. So the network's going to go down sometimes. The computer that you're running, it's going to crash sometimes. You're going to have to be able to handle failures gracefully one way or another. And then there's also data changes. We can't control what the web server is going to do. If it wants to change the data, it's going to change the data, and we just have to be able to handle that. And then there are a couple other fun, interesting problems along the way. So what if we want to do some longitudinal data collection? So we might want that to be incremental, right? If we've scraped three days' worth of data uh, this week, and it took three days to run that script, we don't want it to take another three days to collect the new data a week from now. Let's skip over the ones that we already did and just get what's new. And also. Sometimes these are just slow. We've had scripts that will run for a week. That's pretty long. We might want to parallelize. And then it turns out also that sometimes rate limiting that websites do is based on IP. And at that point, you might want to distribute it across multiple machines. This is an interesting fun side problem. So these are the sort of things that we want to be able to handle. And in fact, we want our end users to be able to handle it. So we have a lot of constraints on what they can do. But we also want to make these really robust scripts. So basically, even though these look like really different problems, all we really want to be able to say is just don't repeat the same stuff that you've already done. Now, it's complicated to say what is the same stuff, right? Because as I just said, the data is constantly changing on the web. You can't expect it to remain the same. You might get a different set of objects. You might get objects that have their attributes changed. So how do we actually say what's the same? What we're actually going to do is ask the user to introduce, introduce a construct called the skip block. And that will be used to actually tell us how to tell whether two objects that we are seeing in different places are, in fact, the same object. And also to associate the code that will actually operate over that object. And so basically, the idea is that we will keep a commit log. And if we have already seen an object that has those key attributes that tell us it's the same object, that means that we can go ahead and skip it the next time we see it. And if we have never seen it before, then we'll go ahead and execute that associated code. So the good thing about this is that the user does not have to reverse engineer the DOM, the server interactions, any of that stuff. They're just reasoning about the output data, which they already know about and think about. So basically, here's sort of the textified representation of that same authors and papers program that we talked about before. Let's go ahead and add a skip block into this. So here what we're saying is if you have already seen an author that has the same name and the same institution as an author we've seen in the past, that means you can go ahead and skip it. That's just assume that's the same one. Don't bother to do that code again. So basically, here are the key attributes, the author name, the author institution. That's what we're using to tell us whether it's the same object. And then we have the block of code that actually operates on it. So this is a durable log. This is not just a per run sort of a situation. So when we come back in a week and try to rescrape the same author, we will know to skip over it. Um, this in any run that I've bolded here, that's the default behavior. Obviously, that's something that we might want to manipulate. So that's a fun, interesting side question. Uh, so basically, how do we tackle all of those disparate problems with this one thing? So extrinsic failures, basically, if the network goes down and we have to restart, let's just skip over all those ones we already did. Pretty straightforward there. For data changes, same deal. If we're getting repeated objects because of how much Craigslist is updating its fresh data, we can just skip over that when we see it. For longitudinal scraping, this will automatically incrementalize. So everything that we scrape this week, we won't have to scrape it again when we come back to it a week later, because it's in the commit log. Uh, if it's just slow, each of these skip blocks, each of the individual objects identified, actually ends up being an independent subtask. So we can distribute that across parallel workers. And if we're handling CAPTCHAs, then we can just do that across different machines. So there are a lot of fun design questions about how we should do these skip blocks. I'm not going to be able to tackle most of these today, but definitely come talk to me. I think one of the really fun ones is how should we split those independent subtasks a bunch, across a bunch of different parallel or distributed workers. It's a really cool design problem. I'm going to go really quickly over a couple of results. So this one's mostly just interesting because it highlights just how much data changes on the web. It turns out that just in a single run, if you add these skip blocks, you can get up to about 2x speed up, just because there's that much new data coming in all the time. So I thought that was interesting. 
Um, this is what we see if we parallelize. You can see we're getting pretty close to the ideal line, with the exception of this Twitter benchmark, which ends up being CPU bound. Uh, turns out if you load a thousand tweets into a page, it gets to be a really big page and it's a lot to process. But if you actually distribute that, this was on a single machine. If you actually distribute that across multiple machines, then you get right back to that ideal line. So it gets to be exactly what you expect and want. Um, we also looked at whether our end users, our, our non-programmer identified people, actually can use this. And the answer is yes. So we kept the reasoning for this construct at such a high level that end users can learn how to use it. People who tell us that they are non-programmers can learn how to use it in seven minutes. And they can add an additional skip block, each new skip block that they might add to their program in about a minute, 61 seconds. So we were very satisfied with those results. And with that, I would love to take any questions. We have, we have time for questions. Seems like skip blocks are a generally useful concept. How would you port this into a more general purpose language? Yeah, so we actually, we spend a while thinking about how would we put this in like a Python script or a Python, you know, if they're using Selenium or some other library to do their own scraping in a more traditional way. We, we looked at how we could do that, and it turns out it's not that hard. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward concept. As long as you've hooked up everything you need for keeping that durable commit log, you're pretty much OK. So uh, who are you partnering with? Uh, you said that you were partnering with people uh, that are non-programmers to do yeah. this? Yeah, we have about, at this point, it's between eight and 10 teams of social scientists who are collecting a bunch of different data with this. It's really fun. So, so how, has that shown up in the publications? Do you have sort of the experience report related to it? So those benchmarks that we showed were basically tasks that we took from, from their target tasks. Okay. But we haven't done sort of the experience report. I think there might be a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of your skip blocks are a form of computational thinking. I mean, when you talk to non-programmers, are they able to reason about skip blocks the same way a computer science or a programmer would? Then, and, you know, what, what has been your experience with that? I don't know if it's exactly the same way. So the way we explained it in the basically the tutorial that we gave them that took them seven minutes to go through was sort of to think about if you were seeing sort of the output row that represented each of these objects, what would you use to decide if two of them were the same? So that was how they were thinking about it. I don't know if that's the same way that a programmer would think about it. That is a really interesting question, and I would, I would love to study that. Question here? Yeah. Considering that you're dealing with captures and the fact that probably if this is semi-adversarial relative to the websites and so forth. Um, <laughs> and also that you're running a CPU scaling problem. So you, do you have a, a variant of this where you're essentially farming out to a, a bunch of cloud machines? And you just, yeah. 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 Yeah, it turns out it's really easy to put this on Amazon Web Searches. Yeah. Right. <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we do. Actually, that, yeah. that works out well? It works out beautifully, you're yeah. Just configure it how to operate it and all that? Yeah. So there is more of this sort of setup work. I think it's definitely going to be easier to tackle if you are a programmer. It's, yeah, getting the AWS UI to work is tough. <laughs> cool. Cool. Do you have a question here? I, I was just going to say, uh, do you have any protections to prevent people from, you know, who are not programmers using the AWS version to DDoS healthcare.gov or? <laughs> I mean, as with any uh, any programming tool, this is going to give people the option to write programs that are bad. Uh, they, they can also DDoS their Amazon Web Services credit card. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> All right, with that, I guess we'll say thank you again to Sarah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Do I know this guy? <laughs> All right, so uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Bill Zorn. Uh, he's going to be speaking about a concept called syncing point. Oh, he, if he can get his laptop to work. Hello? Is that, is it? Do I, I have? Oh, there, there we go. go. Yep. Okay, he's going to be talking about syncing point, um, and I guess we'll find out what that is. Uh, Bill's from UW, and he's also my son, so. <laughs> yeah, so thanks, Dad. Uh, so, so today, today I'll be talking about Syncing Point. This is a project that I've been working on with Dan Grossman, um, who's my advisor, and also uh, Zach Tatlock now. 
I think he's actually not credited in the program because advisors have been changing. But uh, anyway, let's get right into it. So first, let's talk a little bit about good old IEEE 754 floating point. Um, it's fast. It's portable. Um, it's great because it means that just about any programming language these days is at least as good as your TI-84 calculator. Um, IEEE 754 is completely specified. Each operation is correctly rounded, which is to say we try to do it with as much precision as possible. And usually this leads to behavior that's close to the behavior that we would expect from real numbers. But um, sometimes not, right? And it's a very well-known sort of challenge with floating point that reasoning about when the behavior is like real numbers is, is hard. So to give some concrete examples, uh, if we fire up good old Python, we import math, and we run an expression like this. So here I've got pi. Obviously, I'm adding and subtracting the same number to pi. So I should get pi back, right? Uh, which is 4. <laughs> um, if I want to do something slightly more complex, like say I, you know, I'm in algebra and I need to solve the quadratic e equation here, so we can put in some arguments for, uh, for a, b, and c and get x. Um, and we'll see that as we make a very small, keeping b and c the same, our result seems to converge to negative c over b. But as we become even smaller, then we'll see it starting to diverge again. And then eventually we find that there's a 0 at 0. Um, so to, to put this on a graph, right, the, this blue line is the nice, beautiful Mathematica function that we would expect for x as a function of, of a, keeping b and c the same. Those black points are the behavior from IEEE 754 floating point that we saw um, from the points on our previous slide. If we think about this in terms of the actual parabola, right, so here's with a relatively small a. We're, remember, we're solving for the zero, so the, the zero crossings. What our floating point results seem to indicate is that as we make a smaller, um, our parabola is going to become more and more of a line. And eventually, 754 says that if we, make, if we were just to make this line a little bit straighter, eventually it would go through the origin, um, which, which isn't, isn't, isn't right. So um, here's another really fun function. This is sine of 2 to the x. As we get further from the origin, the 2 to the x part will grow faster and faster. So the wave will oscillate faster and faster. Um, IEEE 754 is actually pretty good at evaluating this with doubles. So for 15, we get the right number. For, I don't know, 25.3, we get about eight digits that are right. Um, if we give it a ridiculously large number, like, say, 60, um, we'll actually get all the bits right, which is kind of astonishing, because if we deviate from an integer even slightly, we'll get a result that is completely uncorrelated with what we would expect the real function to do. Right? So um, surprisingly, none of these examples are surprising. Right? Floating point is fully specified. It's just doing what the specification says. All floating point results. I mean, all floating point numbers have the same amount of precision. Um, all results have the same amount of precision. And it's, it's, uh, it's left to the programmer to determine if those bits are actually meaningful and correspond to the behavior of real numbers. So um, I mean, if you're a, if you're a new, numerical methods guy writing you know, something in libm, this is probably fine, because you can afford to spend a lot of time reasoning about your code. But um, in the general case where we just want to do real arithmetic, this seems kind of troublesome. The idea of sinking point is that rather than giving back all those meaningless bits all the time, we will actually dynamically reduce precision, right? We're not going to be any more accurate than IEEE 754, but the precision you do get will correspond to actual behavior of real numbers rather than whatever the floating point format said happens in these weird cases, right? And the cool thing about this is that we can do this with very little overhead. So we only need to keep around a few extra bits. We only need to, to do a few extra bitwise operations. If you, for example, built this into hardware, I think that it could go just about as fast as IEEE 754 floating point. So, Let's go back over the same examples. Um, here's what Python said. What Python really meant here by 4 was like 4.0000, right? Exactly 4. There's a 53-bit significant. It's all zeros. Um, if we do the same thing with sinking point, we still get 4. The answer is 4. But this is saying you know, 4 twiddle, approximately 4. I'm not going to give you any more bits here because I don't know what they are. And if you use this few bits to represent pi, 4 is actually the best you can do. So this, this number makes sense. Um, if we go back to our quadratic formula here, we can see that a lot of our digits are totally bogus. With sinking point, we won't even give you those digits. And we also have an interesting notation here. So this is 0 um, at some exponent. 0 can't have precision. It doesn't have a significant. But it can have an exponent. And if you have an inexact 0 with some exponent, what that really means is like this is a number. It's small. I don't know what it is. But it's less than, its absolute value is less than 2 to that exponent. So this is a huge exponent, right? We're saying a small number that's less than 2 to the fourth. That's not a very encouraging zero for our, our parabola, <laughs> right? And then uh, meanwhile, it, it, I'm cheating a little bit here, because it, if you see a real zero, 
it will actually give you zero. I'm cheating because since b is 2, we can actually do the square root and stuff exactly. If we were to put in like b is 2.1 and get an inexact result, we would see 0 with an exponent. But rather than being like 4, it would be like you know negative 48. So it seems like that result is much more encouraging that you really have a 0 there rather than, I don't know, somewhere between you know, negative 10 and 10. Um, again, with sine, we can see that um, in all of these cases, we chop off not all of the bits, but most of the bits that are bogus. Um, what's cool here is that uh, sinking point is actually smart enough to understand that 60 is a special case because we can compute that exponent exactly. It, w it won't chop off any bits when they're good. But in the cases where your function gives complete garbage, it will just punt and say, oh, I, I don't know what sign is in that, in that range. Um, there's no precision. Right? So um, how does this work? Uh, um, you've probably learned IEEE 754 floating point rounding at least once in your life. I'm going to go over it again, hopefully uh, quickly and a little bit differently than you've, you've seen before. So if I want to represent a real number with bits, um, I can do that with some integer significant times 2 to some exponent, right? So you know, 5 and a quarter is 21 times 2 to the negative 2. Um, let's define two quantities. We have p, which is the number of bits in the significant. This is pretty straightforward. It's just the precision. And then we also have this quantity that I'm going to call n, which is the exponent minus 1. So you can think of n, like if this number is inexact, you can think of n as like the index or like the place of the, the, the most significant bit whose value I don't know. So all the bits below n, I don't know what those are. And those are my numbers exact, in which case they're 0. Right? And what's cool about these concepts is that we can actually use them to like, explain how IEEE 754 rounding works. So for, like, for doubles, we choose some maximum p, and we choose some minimum n, um, 53 and negative 1,075. And we say, in order to round into a double, if I have bits past my max p or bits with significance below my minimum n, round those bits off. Um, and so that minimum n is not a random number. It's actually the minimum exponent that a double can have minus the precision. And what's cool about this is that like, subnormal numbers just fall out naturally. I don't have to do anything special. Um, subnormals, they all have the same n. We're just letting the high bits of the significant go to 0. Right? So for, for that's IEEE 754. Um, for sinking point, what we're going to do is actually determine what these values should be dynamically per operation so that we get rid of the precision that we don't know how to compute. Right? So um, we need to come up with some rules. For addition and subtraction, uh, we're actually going to be bounded by n. If I have two numbers and I have some low bits in one that I don't know, if you think about it, if I add more bits over top of those bits, I'm not magically going to learn what those bits are. Right? The granularity of the number that I know to the least you know, like, like absolute place is the granularity of the output. So we'll take, um, among our inexact inputs, choose the largest value of, of n and use that as the rounding for our, 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 our output. Right? And then we're actually not really constrained by p here. So we can uh, say, like, if we want to just emulate IEEE 754 floating point, just use whatever the maximum for the format is. Yeah. Um, so for multiplication and division, it's the other way around. Um, we're not really constrained by absolute n, but we are constrained by p. So if I have two inputs, then the precision of the result can't be more than whichever inexact result had uh, less precision. Right. And then uh, hopefully powers and roots are like multiplication. Uh, this is still being developed, so uh, maybe not. We'll, we'll find out in testing. Um, for more interesting functions, floor is kind of cool because the result is actually exact, right? as long as I know I'm between two integers. Um, if I have functions that are periodic, like f mod, then my rules become more interesting. Um, f mod is really a subtraction, right? So we have like you know x uh, mod y. It's the remainder. So uh, my dividend is going to supply n because I'm using it in a subtraction. And then the other thing in that subtraction is going to be my my divisor times some integer. I can get the integer exactly. So I can actually get the effect of using the n from that multiplied divisor by taking p. This is kind of a you can talk talk to me about it later. Uh, and then sine is also really fun. With sine, uh, we're not bound by n, but our precision is actually bound by the granularity with which, with, with which you know our input relative to the granularity of pi. Um, so uh, yeah, so these are, these are the rules. Um, still work in progress. Um, it's cool because these are very simple rules, and they can give us some confidence that we have meaningful precision um, without having to do a whole bunch of real analysis or anything like that. Um, note that this is still an approximation. It's not a sound guarantee. Um, the idea is that it should have relatively low like false positives, right? Um, if if I say you have bogus precision, there's probably something wrong in, in your computation, and hopefully 
I won't in you know, sinking point will not in most cases cut off bits unnecessarily. Um, so this is part of a larger project I'm working on called Titanic, which is a tool for building and reasoning about <laughs> systems. Oh, by the way, this is a, this is neural style transfer. This is a neural network art. Yeah, um, and also thanks to Dan for the for the for the for the, for the titles. Um, his 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 uh, his help has been very evident here. Um, so uh, Titanic is a tool for reasoning about and building things like sinking point and IEEE seven five four floating point. I'm also interested in other stuff like reasoning about uh, uh, performance. You know, how much accuracy can we throw away to get speed? With and also uh, exotic types like whatever Google's doing in their new TPUs. Or I know Microsoft has uh, FP eight, which looks kind of interesting. Um, and then I'm also working on uh, FE Bench. Uh, Titanic uses the standards from FE Bench. So uh, that's another cool project started by Pavel and Zach and the Herbie guys. Um, props to them. But yeah, talk to me about any of these things. OK, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> OK, we have some time for questions. Let's start with Ross. Is it meaningful to compare interval arithmetic with sinking point? Absolutely. So uh, when I say specifically that like we're still in approximation, we're not trying to provide a sound guarantee. Um, the sound version of it would be interval arithmetic. You could imagine wrapping sinking point in something like interval arithmetic in order to re return, rather than one of these fast rules, which is quick to compute but not necessarily sound, like an actual interval arithmetic supplied guarantee. That already exists. Um, it's John Gustafson's unums, essentially. And the problem is that with interval arithmetic, um, you have a lot of, you know, if you will, false positives. For any large computation, it can be really hard to figure out what the interval is, right? Um, with sinking point, we're hoping to you know, do the opposite thing. We're fast rather than sound, and we have low false positives rather than a sound guarantee. But yeah, that's a, that's a very good comparison. Empirically, you don't know how much. <laughs> Empirically, uh, no. But so that's, that's the main evaluation thrust here. What I'd like to do is have a large set of benchmarks and go through and say, look, here's the number. Here's the real result. Here's the number of bits we give you. Does it correspond to the place where they differ? And then, I mean, interval arithmetic, depending on the size of the benchmark, would either give you no information or you know, also be somewhere in there. So. OK, one more question. Let's see, how about back here? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned this has pretty modest overhead. Do you think you could actually go faster than regular floating point by, you know, I guess, dynamically swapping to lower precision? Yeah, so there's, there's a really interesting question here. I see no reason why this can't be implemented in hardware. I mean, I'm not a hardware guy. I don't like you know, design adders. But um, it is kind of cool, because as we chop precision off, we can do less and less work, right? There's also a potential for if you had a type that had a variable sized um, exponent and significant, you could get much more dynamic range from the same number of bits, right? Because you could have very small uh, significant numbers with a huge exponent. Um, so yes, there's certainly considerations here. And Titanic is a general framework. So it would be good for reasoning about ways that we can throw precision away in order to get operations to go faster. All right, let's thank the speaker again. So, so just a very brief anecdote about how small our world is. So uh, when I started at Berkeley in 1982 as a PhD student, my advisor was Velvel Kahn, who is the inventor of IEEE floating point. And when I went into his office, he had a calculator. And he would tell you, I, I can show you calculations, much like we just saw, that don't work correct, correctly on the calculator. And he made that, he, he solved that problem you know, for all of us. So that's a great benefit. But it, it shows you that these issues are ti uh, timeless. And so um, you know, uh, just keep working on them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was a plan all along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's the deep state. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. With that, we're going to in introduce our next talk. Um, uh, we have the, uh, the speaker, Stuart uh, Pernsteiner, and he's going to be speaking about verified extra ex extraction with native types, from, and he's from the UW. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to be talking about uh, extraction of code from proof assistance. Uh, and so typically the way this is done is you write some code in a proof assistant such as Coq, you verify it, and then if you want to actually run this code, uh, the way you do that is you use a process called extraction, which uh, in Coq's case turns your Coq code into OCaml code, and then you compile that with the OCaml compiler to get a binary that you can actually run. Uh, now the downside to this approach is that it's completely unverified. The extraction procedure is unverified, the OCaml compiler is unverified, you link the thing with an unverified runtime. And so all of those nice properties that you proved about your Coq program, uh, you don't actually have any guarantee, really, that they still hold on the executable that you're actually going to run. 
Uh, now, more recently, there's been actually a couple different projects working on verified extraction for cock. Uh, so there's OOF, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. And there's also Certicock. Uh, these make some different trade-offs in a few places, um, but they have the same general idea. Uh, you take your cock code, compile it down to C or a C-like language, uh, and then run that through Comcert, which is, uh, of course, verified. And OOF and Certicock are verified as well. So you can be highly confident that uh, whatever cock program you feed into this process, uh, the binary that you get out is going to exhibit the same behavior. Uh, and this is really nice. This is a big improvement over previous ways of getting sort of uh, verified binaries out of COC uh, programs. Um, so for example, uh, in 2015, Andrew Pell uh, had to do this extensive manual proof of equivalence between a COC implementation of SHA-256 and a C implementation, uh, which could then be compiled with Comcert. Um, whereas with something like OOF, you can actually do this uh, translation automatically. Right? It will automatically compile the uh, COC version of SHA-256 down to a C version, uh, and it's guaranteed to exhibit the same behavior. Uh, but sort of not everything is perfect here, uh, and so let's talk about performance. Uh, <laughs> so if you run a C version of SHA-256 on this little tiny input, it runs in basically no time at all, uses two megabytes of memory. Uh, if you run the OOF extracted uh, verified SHA-256 binary on the same exact tiny input, it runs for four seconds and uses three gigs of memory. <laughs> Uh, so that's obviously terrible. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, and this comes down to a question of data representation. So in the C version of SHA-256, when it wants to manipulate a word of the input or of the, the sort of hash state, uh, it uses a real 32-bit integer. Uh, you know, it's four bytes in memory, it fits in a register, right? Doesn't get much simpler than that. Uh, the OOF extracted version uses the integer type from the standard library, which is what was used in the, the original COC implementation. And uh, that implementation looks like this. Uh, Cock represents integers as a linked list where every node of the list contains one bit of the number. Uh, and so this is clearly not optimized for performance. Uh, it has some nice properties for reasoning, but you know, no one was ever intending for this code to actually be executed. Uh, and of course, it's very slow and uses tons of memory. Uh, so what we would, oh, and uh, sort of, there's no reason that it needs to be this bad. Right? We're not working with sort of unbounded integers or anything wild like that inside of the SHA-256 implementation. Uh, you know, SHA-256, the algorithm itself, is defined in terms of 32-bit words. The COC implementation uses uh, this sort of refinement type. It's an unbounded integer, but restricted to the range 0 to 2 to the 32. There's only 2 to the 32 possible values of this type. And so we should be able to represent this type at runtime using a real 32-bit integer. And so that's the idea of the native types feature. And specifically, we want a way to map uh, COC types down to custom uh, data representations at the C level. So for example, we'd like to map that word type from the SHA-256 implementation down to C's int type. Uh, just mapping the types is not enough. Uh, if you've ever worked with uh, you know, custom extraction uh, sort of changes in COC, uh, you know that just mapping the types uh, doesn't improve the, the asymptotic performance of your algorithms. So you'd also like to map certain functions down to custom C-level implementations, uh, such as mapping addition mod 2 to the 32 down to you know, a real addition expression at the C-level. Uh, and then a couple other design constraints uh, when we were building this feature. Uh, we'd like to maintain all of our existing correctness guarantees. So it all has to still be verified. Uh, and we'd like to uh, make it extensible to new types and new functions. Uh, and in particular, the reason for this is that updating all of these compiler correctness proofs is a lot of work. And we'd rather not have to redo that work if we want to add new types or new functions later. Uh, so our design for this is we did not want to just sort of add int as a new type supported by the compiler, um, since then if we came back and wanted to add double later on, we would have to change this definition further. Uh, and you know, this is sort of used in basically every part of the compiler. We have to redo tons of proofs again. So what we did instead is we added a sort of generic native type uh, variant here. And it's parameterized by this native type definition. And this native type definition is basically a big record that contains all the information that the compiler needs to know to compile uh, values or uh, variables of this type. And so in particular, uh, for this you know, SHA-256 int case, uh, we have to give it a high-level representation of the type, which is this word type. Uh, this is just a cock type as used in the SHA-256 implementation. We have to give it a low-level representation, which is just C's int type. And then we have to prove a bunch of lemmas about the relationship between these two types uh, and just general properties uh, about the different representations. And the benefit of doing it this way is that we can actually uh, define more of these native type definitions, as many as we want. And no matter how many of these we define, we never have to go back and touch that uh, type uh, enumeration ever again. Uh, 
our approach to doing uh, the mapping of functions is very similar. Uh, instead of just adding explicitly a new variant for integer addition, we add a generic one uh, that supports any native operation. Uh, it's, again, parameterized by uh, one of these operation definition records and takes some number of arguments. And I'm not actually going to show you the native operation definition record because it's actually much more complicated than the one for types. Uh, and in particular, it's more complicated because it has to support the semantics of every IR used in the compiler. So every IR that's used within the compiler, uh, in the semantics for that IR, there needs to be some definition of what happens when you step over a native operation, uh, which means we need enough information in the record to support all of those sort of variants of the step relation. Uh, there are a couple different ways that we could have done this. Um, what we chose to do is instead of having sort of one function in the record for every single IR in the compiler, we just have one function for every single value representation in the compiler. And there's many fewer of those than there are uh, different IRs. Uh, now, an advantage of doing it this way is that it just simplifies the, the definitions of these native types. If you want to add a new one, you just have sort of less stuff to write in that record. Um, it also simplifies some of the compiler correctness proofs. So a lot of passes, uh, it turns out, just use the same value representation on both sides. And so when you get to the native operation case of the, the sort of simulation proof, it's basically trivial because the left side and right side are doing basically identical behaviors. Um, the downside, though, is this doesn't give us a way to let native operations call functions. So for example, you couldn't implement map or other higher order functions as native operations. And the reason for that is that uh, different intermediate representations, even ones that use the same value representation, uh, actually have sort of slightly different ways of representing program state uh, or function calls. Uh, and so there's no way to uh, sort of provide all the necessary information uh, to do those function calls at every level of the, or for every IR within the compiler. Um, the big downside of this is that uh, we can't implement recursive eliminators as native operations. So you can't, for example, write a, a cock function that takes an int and you know, runs some code for every value from 0 up to n. Since that would involve calling a function uh, from inside, or it, you can write that function in cock, of course, but you can't sort of uh, translate it as a native operation to sort of, for example, a while loop in C. Um, but you know, we got all of this sort of working, uh, and it is pretty extensible. We were able to add not just ints and addition, um, but we also added sort of all of the normal arithmetic operators and comparisons you would expect to see on ints. Um, also, some conversions such as int to nat, which converts to the cox just. Uh, nat type, which is sort of very commonly used. Um, we also added the double type uh, with the same sort of arithmetic operations, conversions, comparisons. Uh, and finally, uh, our uh, sort of native types and operations do support memory. Uh, so we can define double arrays, uh, which are heap allocated, uh, and some operations on those. You, know, you can allocate them, you can get, and you can do functional updates on the, the contents of the array. Uh, the proof ver burden is not too terrible. Uh, it's 65 lines roughly for each type definition and bit over 200 lines for each operation. And that includes some groups of operations. So for example, all binary arithmetic operators on ints are basically the same. Uh, and so you know, those only get counted once in this average. Uh, and finally, uh, in terms of performance, uh, we got some pretty big benefits from this. So back on that SHA-256 example, where previously we were running for four seconds and using three gigs of RAM, uh, the version that uses ints, uh, this much more efficient data representation, is much faster. Uh, it's 50 times faster and uses 87 times less memory. Uh, and that's it. So I'll be happy to take questions. All right, questions? So uh, 87 times less memory is really good, but I note that it's still 20 times more memory than the C implementation. So what's, what, what would it take to go the next uh, 20x? Yeah, uh, so uh, we haven't profiled it uh, in sort of very much detail, but I think the main sort of source of memory allocations is uh, allocating closures to make function calls. Uh, and a lot of those closures don't really need to be on the heap. Because, um, for example, you allocate the closure, make the call, and then never use the closure again. Uh, so you could allocate that on, on the stack, but we've not implemented that optimization yet. Other questions? How tied is this to like targeting C versus some um, other language? Uh, not very. It's just C already has a verified compiler that we could use as the back end. Uh, <coughs> and with that as our back end, we, of course, chose you know, C types and such as the, the target for the native types. Can it free memory? 
like if I have a long running application, will I just leak memory forever? Yeah, so we don't actually have a garbage collector uh, in the OOF, you know, I was going to say the OOF runtime, but OOF doesn't really have a runtime. Uh, <laughs> so there's no garbage collector, uh, which is, I guess, another contributor to the, the high memory usage. Uh, we do have some sort of unverified, like an unverified slab allocator that can do some sort of uh, region-based memory allocation. Uh, so you can you know, do some operation, and when you're done, copy out the result and throw away all of the intermediates that were allocated. Um, but that's sort of as good as it gets right now. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, a, it's a little bit of a vague question, but uh, I, I think one of the arguments you're making is a, is a reduction in TCB argument by saying you can remove mm -hmm. the OCaml compiler from the TCB. Mm -hmm. But the OCaml compiler is already in your TCB if you're working with COC. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I see that you're gaining something, but I'm not exactly sure how to pinpoint you know, exactly what the reduction in TCB is. Yeah, so our argument there is that uh, when you link the OCaml compiler into your extracted code, or the OCaml runtime into your extracted code, you have to rely on the correctness of that runtime under every input that you feed to that code. Whereas uh, when you use the OCaml runtime as sort of part of your compilation process or your, your verification process, you only have to trust it to run correctly on your code, the code that you're feeding through the compiler. Uh, you don't have to worry about what if you know, I'm exposing this as a web service and someone is sending me adversarial inputs trying to break the OCaml runtime. You're only feeding it sort of code that you have written, essentially. All right, let's thank the speaker.